everybody, thank you for joining me once again where people continue to be wrong on the interwebs. They continue to want to say things for some reason. This is Sophie Medlin, who I've never heard of before the last few days, where she suddenly started to come up on my feed. Various other commentators have had their things to say about some of what she said in this interview, and perhaps other interviews, who knows. Um, this is a woman with incredible Dunning-Kruger, stunning ignorance of the actual science and facts surrounding the subject matter at hand. And frankly, well, I'll leave it to you to make your own assessment, both visually and otherwise, as to who it is that's likely to actually have their health status under control, their own adiposity under control, for example. Um, yeah. Anyway, let's hear Sophie. This is nearly two and a half hours long, so I'm sure I'll edit most of this out before it comes to you. Um, but I'll go through it from start to finish, I think, in my usual style and uh, correct errors of interpretation or statements that are just false. So let's do that, shall we? Sophie, the floor is yours for now until I need to pause you, which I assume will be quite regularly. Off you go. If your gut is not quite working optimally, even though you might not have any specific symptoms, it can still have an impact on your mental health and your mental performance. When people are busy and they're working too hard and they're doing a side hustle and everything else is high pressure, people tend to make their diet quite small, so they might end up eating the same types of foods on repeat. And inevitably, those ways of eating have an impact on your gut health. When yes, but we actually don't understand gut health from the standpoint of what you're talking about, Sophie, that being the microbe biome, its makeup, its speciation, a peaceable balance, a healthy balance or otherwise. We know very, very little about that. In fact, there are many, many different sorts of microbiome set up, which are associated with people apparently without any health problems. And there are many which are associated with people who apparently do. Uh, however, cause and effect is not something that we can comment on with any knowledge of that, actually. So, Let's see what you do have to say on it. Whether you feel it in your gut or not. This episode is an interview with one of the UK's leading experts on gut health. No, no, she isn't. And if she is, the UK needs to lift its game very, very seriously because she's nothing of the sort, patently. Her name is Sophie Medlin and she is a dietitian. She's also the chair of the British Dietetic Association for London. And she works as a lecturer at King's College London and is actually also on TV these days. As well, she must be very, very knowledgeable then to be on TV because only knowledgeable people get to be on TV, don't they? An expert for Channel's 4 show. She's not an expert at all. We'll get to that though. Which is all about. I mean, you know, make your own assessment here, boys and girls. Just use your senses such that they may be to decide whether or not this person is remotely worth listening to regarding health in any way. Let's carry on. The science of the gut. Anyway, it's the science of the gut, the, the very thing we understand very poorly indeed. I learned so much in this episode, and you're going to learn so much as well about... No, I don't think I will, actually. By the way, this bloke purports to be a medical doctor. Let's see. The gut and about healthy nutrition and about what are all the myths around things like seed... There are a lot of people, of course, running around claiming to be medical doctors who aren't. ...oils, and should you eat carbs, and is fried food bad for you, and what are the things that we can do to help improve our gut health, and how the gut-brain axis works, and how like our gut health contributes to all of the other aspects of our life? Inevitably, if it's not happy, it's going to be screaming at your brain all the time, and that is noisy and difficult for your brain to cope with, and that can lead to things like brain fog and struggling with focus and concentration, for example. Similarly, if your gut isn't happy, but you don't really know from other symptoms, but you're getting loads of bugs, infections, viruses all the time, you notice you're really susceptible, that's a good time to start looking at your gut health. And I think, I guess, for this audience, what's really important to recognise is this connection between your gut and your brain and how they are constantly communicating with each other for better or worse. At the moment, according to the YouTube analytics, 81% of you who are watching this on YouTube have not yet hit the subscribe button. And so... I wonder why. If you're, for example, in the now 81% of people who are watching this on YouTube, but who are not subscribed to the channel, I would love it if you could do so. And it would be awesome to get that number down to 50%. And it would be cool to get like 50-50 sub, non-sub. Why would you not aim for 100% of people subscribing? That's my aim. Ratio, just, just for fun. Sophie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank this you for having me. You're an expert on gut health. No, I she isn't. Yeah I'm, yeah, I'm the poo expert. The poo no, you're not. Not at all. 
you're full of shit, but you're not actually an expert in it or, or the gut microbiome at all, actually. Expert, yeah. <laughs> and you've been on TV talking about poo. She's been on TV, so she's an expert. Of course. My bad. And I would love to talk about poo and everything about the gut. But I guess as a starting point, how did, how did we get here? How did you come to become the gut expert? What's the kind of a She's bit? not. It's a self-claimed title, clearly, or one given to her by people who know even less than she does. It doesn't make her an expert. She clearly shows unequivocally during this inter uh, interview that she's anything but an expert. Okay? Just the facts, though. Let's have your life story. Yeah, great question. So I was a weird 15-year-old child that knew I wanted to be a dietitian. So I was very lucky to kind of have this direction from a very young age. I was studying catering at GCSE and I had a catering teacher who was a nutritionist and we did some stuff on like celiac disease and adapting diets a little bit. And I thought, yeah, I think that's something I might like to do. So I did a little bit of reading and thought, well, I could be a nutritionist which is a bit quicker to train to do, but that won't necessarily open up all the doors to me. And then yes, so what's happened in the field of nutrition is there's one organisation who claims authority in the field and tries to litigate against anybody giving advice, actually, not successfully, but tries constantly to litigate against people giving nutrition advice who are not a member of their fraternity, their theology, their church of pseudoscience. I'm talking about the dietetics associations around the world uh, who have claimed ownership over a qualification called dietetics and a, a working title dietitian, which is fine, they can have that, but they're also now and have been for years attempting to try and get everyone who says they're a nutritionist, not a nutritionist, not to say that, not to give advice, purely because people who are actual nutritionists and who actually study actual nutrition science will almost universally disagree with everything spouted erroneously by a dietitian. Dietitians are indoctrinated by a bought and paid for theological system of misinformation and pseudoscience to spout absolute nonsense, and they're mandated to do so unless they lose their accreditation as a dietitian. And so that's the problem that most nutritionists are up against. It's an appeal to authority. It's a, it's a self-claimed authority. It's a bought and paid for thing. It's not appropriate. They are not scientists. They are not experts in nutrition. They are universally very, very limited people very limited indeed in terms of their actual knowledge base intelligence application of scientific principle. It's a very, very sad thing, uh, and it needs pointing out, hence this video. So off you go, Sophie. Point out your flaws to us, and we'll underline them when you do. I read about being a dietitian, knowing that I could then go and work in the NHS and do all sorts of other things within the world of nutrition. I thought, well, I might as well keep all the doors open. And at this point, I was predicted these and E's and U's in my GCSE. <laughs> so I thought, I better do some work. Exactly my point. Exactly my point. Thank you. I can make sure I get the grades I need to get into university, but it was a really, really good motivator. Um, and I managed to turn that all around and get got the good enough grades to get in. And uh, yeah, yeah. But what's good enough grades to get into a, a program of indoctrination that will, will train you in anything but nutrition science? They'll train you in ideology and how to spout ideology and how to do that confidently, despite the fact that anyone can take one look at most people who spout their ideology and go, Hmm, I wonder. Mm, I'm going to stop wondering immediately. Okay, what's next? Studied nutrition and dietetics, and the story starts from there. Most dietitians start working in the NHS, and that's what I did. So I was in, in the UK, yes. The NHS for about eight years. I did some interesting stuff in elderly medicine where you get really good at kind of. Uh, you didn't do anything in medicine. You're a dietitian. They don't do medicine, they do dietetics, love. Standing about nutrition support, which is basically supporting undernutrition, so malnutrition, doing lots of tube feeding. Yeah, but dietitians don't know how to do that because they're full of ideology and nonsense and anti science and misinformation about nutrition, as we're about to see. In making difficult decisions about whether people should be tube fed or whether that's the best thing for them or not, given it might be the end of their life, that sort of thing. Um, I then did head and neck cancer, where you look after people who 
have all kinds of horrific tumors in their mouth and their throat and all sorts of different places where obviously eating is massively compromised. And at that same time, I was doing a split role with intestinal failure. And then I went on to do a full-time intestinal failure role um, where I was, you know, just super inspired by amazing colorectal surgeons doing incredible things, amazing specialist nurses, stoma nurses, people who were just turning people's lives around and people who were in their most sort of vulnerable moments of their life. Um, and nutrition has a massive impact on what comes out your bottom, right? What you put in the top end has an impact on what comes out the bottom. Well, that's why you're an expert. Good. It's the incisive understanding of things, clearly, that makes you an expert. Goodness me. What you eat impacts what you excrete. Thanks. And when you've had any kind of bowel surgery or you are suffering in terms of your digestion, what you put in has a huge impact, not only on your nutritional status, but also on your on your quality of life. So your experience of eating. So if you eat the wrong things in inverted commas, you're going to be potentially incontinent and having all sorts of terrible problems that really affect your quality of life and make your life very small. And when I was able to see what a massive difference I could make in that environment to people's quality of life, to their experience of living, to their experience of eating, their relationship with food, I was like, this is what I want to do forever. <laughs> so I stuck, I've stuck with that very much in terms of my clinical expertise. I uh, was then a lecturer and researcher for five years, most recently at King's College in London. And at that time, I was struggling a bit with kind of... I Everything, apparently. Love academia. I love teaching. I love working with students. It makes me really happy. I love that kind of mentoring aspect of it. But I was struggling with some of the kind of things that other people found easy, the admin side of things, timetabling, that kind of thing. Things that might seem like they don't really matter because you should have admin support, but you just don't in those kinds of environments. And it's things that you know upset the students because they don't necessarily know where they're supposed to be. And so I was talking to my mentor and she was saying, look, you know, if you were a student, we'd say to you, why don't you get tested for like dyslexia and other conditions like that. And I thought, well, that's probably a good idea. So I got to immediately pathologize people. Tested and I found out that I've got dyslexia, dyspraxia and ADHD. So full hat trick. <laughs> and at this point in my life, I was trying to make a decision as to whether I wanted to pursue a bit more private practice and see more patients, which I'd continue to do through my academic practice. Um, and maybe yeah, we all have our crosses to bear. Absolutely. We do some TV work, which I'd started to do a bit of and work with the media a bit more and do some consultancy or whether to do my PhD. And getting that diagnosis made me realize that actually I could torture myself for three years or four years trying to do my PhD, or I could make this decision to focus on the things that I'm naturally good at, the things that I'm don't find so challenging the things that come to me easily rather than trying to push in a direction that's always going to be a difficulty for me. So that's what I did. I quit my job at King's, which was a massive deal, set up the business a kind of couple of years before that, did two, both at the same time for a long time, which was far too much. Um, but yeah, I've been running my clinic business called City Dietitians for about four years now uh, um, outside of King's and uh, I've got a team of 10 or 11, maybe even 12 dietitians now all with our own specialities. I also run a consultancy company where we design vitamins and probiotic products for, for different companies. And yeah, I do some TV work, media work, things like this. Fantastic. That's like the most coherent kind of answer to that question I've ever heard. Like, <laughs> what's your life though, right? Yeah, it's, it's great. Like, <laughs> you've clearly had practice in front of a camera. Um, what is a dietitian? <sighs> yeah, great question. Lovely place to start. So a dietitian is like the, we're like the medical nutrition people as well. No, you're not. No, you are an indoctrinated bunch of buffoons who spout nothing but disinformation and anti-science. As a theological um, position statement on, on a number of issues around nutrition, all of which you fundamentally have wrong from the ground up, completely wrong. That's what a dietitian is, a misinformationist, a propagandist. I would usually say. So if you have a medical problem that you want advice on in terms of your diet. No, you don't you don't qualify to give medical advice on any topic. You are not medically qualified as a dietitian. You need a dietitian. No, you don't. That's the last thing you need. Only a dietitian in the UK. No. False. Okay, you wouldn't want to see a nutritionist for yes, that. Yes, you would if you want some advice, likely advice, or any possibility of advice that is correct regarding nutrition, because you will not get that from a dietitian, unless that dietitian is speaking outside of their accepted narrative, in which case the Dietetics Association will at some point strike that individual off. Okay. That nutritionists aren't medically trained. You wouldn't want to see a nutritional therapist. They're much more on the alternative therapy spectrum. So dietitians are the medical nutrition people. No, they are not still. 
We're the only people who are allowed to work in hospitals in the NHS. That doesn't make you medically qualified or correct. You're not. Kind of stuff. Um, nutritionists are basically there to help healthy people get healthier. So they're No, that's false. Completely false. Amazing at public health, incredible at research, but really important to remember that anyone can call themselves a nutritionist. That's right. People who can think for themselves. People who probably have, most of them, pretty good qualifications actually in the science of nutrition, which is the last thing a dietitian has. They don't. So in this country, the term nutritionist isn't regulated, which means that there are some people who have just done a quick, you know, 30 pounds. There are some people claiming to be nutritionists who have no qualifications at all. Buyer beware, basically. You should check the credentials of whoever you're going to listen to in any field. And anyone with a dietitian's credential is almost certainly a buffoon. That is a fact. They are almost certainly an indoctrinated puppet of a theological society that knows nothing whatever about science or human nutritional requirements. That is a fact. I'm sorry. Okay. What's next? And nutritionist. I don't know, training course online, and now are calling themselves a nutritionist. So you have to be a little bit careful with the credentials of a nutritionist that you're taking. Or anybody, in fact. Taking advice from, but that doesn't mean to say there aren't incredible nutritionists out there doing amazing work in Correct, lots there are. of different areas. So I don't mean to diminish them as colleagues, they just do a different job to us. Yeah. And so. That's right. The ones that are scientifically based and credentialed and qualified are talking about science and actual nutritional requirements for human beings, as opposed to what dietitians are doing, which is spouting mindless theology. What sort of medical training do you have as a dietitian? None. A bit like if you think about a physiotherapist, you would say, okay, so a physiotherapist is different to like a massage therapist or a sports therapist. They're qualified people who've gone in and done placements in hospitals and worked alongside doctors and nurses to learn their trade. That's so what? a different job. The same as dietitians. So we do three long placements as part of our university training uh, where we go into the hospitals and learn from other dietitians on the job. And right, so it's an indoctrination process. Okay, good. Then we are registered with the HCPC, the Healthcare Professions Agency, and they help us to regulate everything that we do. So if I do something wrong... Yes, they mandate what you can and cannot say. And that is the, that is the fault. That is the flaw. That is the problem. Because what they're telling you you can say is universally, fundamentally, demonstrably anti-scientific, misinformational, and false. I'm accountable and I can lose my registration like a doctor or a nurse could, unlike other people within the profession, sort of the nutrition profession at large, where there's no accountability. So they could say anything at all and something could go really wrong and it's not their fault because there's no one regulating them. Nice. Yeah, I think nutrition is one of those things where yeah. Occasionally, people would ask me, "Hey, you know, you're a doctor, therefore, like, what should I do about X, Y, Z?" I'd be like, "That sounds like nutrition." We had like two lectures on it yeah, yeah. in the start of first year. No one cared about it ever since then. And the only contact I had with dietitians was, "Oh, we're we're feeding this patient through a tube. Let's call the dietitian and then get them to do some alchemy and tell us what formula <laughs> to prescribe." Yeah. Um, or there would often be cardiac arrest calls downstairs to the dietitians because a lot of them would faint in yeah. the morning. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm really unfamiliar with the nutrition side of, I guess, medicine and life and yeah. also with, I guess, the job of a dietitian. But I guess I'm, you know, for, for, for people listening to this who maybe do not have officially diagnosed pr colorectal problems or bowel mm -hmm. problems or stomas or things like that, what does a dietitian do for a, I guess, normal, healthy person? So dietitians don't get involved very much with normal, healthy people. We're mostly dealing with disease or problems. So mo and not making it any better. Most of my patients would have a problem with their bowel. It might not be like a diagnosed thing. They might say, I get this really unpleasant wind and it's really bothering me and we can work on that. But generally people will have a problem before they come and see me. In my kind of public facing work, I guess we're talking about gut health education and trying to get people to look after their guts so that we don't end up in the situation where they're in my clinic with a physical problem with their bowel or in surgery because of a physical problem with their bowel. So that's where we talk about how we can really optimize gut health, not only for our bowel health, let's call it, but also for our general health, because our gut has a massive impact on our mental health and on our physical health and our risk of loads of different diseases and disorders. And actually, the more we look at gut health, the more we realise that it is impacting every part of our body and every system in our body. How did 
how does gut health impact all the like the 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 thing that's always struck me whenever I listen to podcasts where where they're talking about the gut is that it seems like the gut is kind of this sort of black box we don't quite know what's going on but we know that it impacts literally everything. There you go. We have ideas. We have mechanistic speculations about how gut health affects overall health, but that's not a joined up story. There are a number of leaps of faith in there. This is not a hard science. Uh, sure. I wonder if you can kind of break open that black box a bit. To what extent does the gut impact all, all these things that you talked about? Yeah, I'd love to. Let's talk about that. So obviously on a very basic level, your gut is where all of your nutrition is absorbed and every bit of your body is physically made from the foods that you're eating. So if you imagine your skin is made from proteins and lipids that come from your diet, the things that you're consuming, you're basically just a big walking blob of protein with other bits and pieces floating around in there. So actually everything that we eat has an impact on the structure and function of the whole of our body. So if your gut in terms of its general function isn't great, then we can have real big problems. And these are kind of things, for potentially even things like gallstones, which are super common, other bits and pieces, generally just not consuming a very balanced diet. So then- No, balance is not what's required in the human diet. What's required in the human diet is species specificity and appropriateness for our species. Homo sapiens sapiens, human beings, we evolved in a set niche. Like every other animal extant on this planet, we are a nutritional um we have we have a niche we have a a role that we've we've developed in we are specialists like every other animal we are obligate hyper carnivores that is what's required not balance okay you need to follow the diet appropriate for your species not some idea balance which is thought of as a good thing of course Balance is associated with fairness, justice, and light, isn't it? It must be a good thing to be balanced in our diet. Well, no. Balance is not appropriate. Okay, what's next? Your gut has to work harder for various different things. We're using different pathways. So having a healthy gut is super important to the yes. structure and function of the whole of your body and how it's working. But that's mainly we're talking about kind of the first bit of the small bowel. So the bowel, the first bit of the bowel, which is the small bowel, which is meters and meters and meters long, travels into the colon. And in the colon, you've got like this amazing ecosystem of bacteria and other microorganisms that are constantly communicating with the rest of our body. And this is the bit that we really have been learning more and more about over the last kind of 30 years or so. Yes, true, but we still know almost nothing about it. Though, but it's really come into the fore now. How our microbiome, so the, the bacteria that live in our colon, are interacting with the rest of our body. And how that works is that when we eat various different foods, so let's take plant fiber as an example, you eat some. That's not food. That's contraindicated toxic nonsense that our colon has not evolved to do well on or to absorb nutrient from in any way, shape, or form. That is not food. That is pro-inflammatory, physically damaging nonsense full of plant toxins and anti-nutrients, as well as its deleterious mechanical effect on the colon. Fruits and vegetables, they travel, the bits of it that you can't digest, the bits we can't break down. Most of it. Travel through to our colon, where they're fermented by different species of bacteria. To a very small degree. The ability, the fermentative ability of the human colon is near none compared to actually herbivorous close relatives or somewhat herbivorous close relatives, for example, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, etc. Those kind of animals, they have a cecum. They have a vast store, a vast capacity of fermentative ability for fibrous plant materials. We do not. Our ability to ferment any fibre at all to speak of is basically vestigial. And it comes with the associated difficulties and issues of mechanical damage to our colonic epithelial linings, the irritation there too, the loosening of the gap junctions, which is very, very problematic, the pro-inflammatory nature of all of that, not to mention the plant toxins and anti-nutrients of all of that. Okay, that's what we understand about it. What's next? 
<laughs> and yeasts and other types of microorganisms. And in that fermentation process, they produce some gas and they produce other things, but they pr like some short chain fatty acids, which are basically 100% saturated. Really importantly, produce some metabolites, some things that interact with our bodies. Mm -hmm. So things like short chain fatty acids, for example, butyrate is the sort of strongest research example that we have. Right, good. When butyrate is released by probiotic bacteria in the colon, that travels through into the rest of our bloodstream and interacts with the rest of our body. It helps to control inflammation. Yes. But only when it's uptaken by cells and undergoes a metabolic transmutation from butyrate to beta hydroxybutyrate, which is what again? Oh, that's right. It's the most common ketone body. So it doesn't matter one jot whether the ketone producing substance is absorbed into the blood as butyrate or whether it's produced by the breakdown of stored fatty acids in the human system. Either way, it's the same stuff. Okay, so there goes that argument for needing fibre in your guts to produce butyrate. You don't at all. Okay. We've seen incredible work with butyrate production being controlling of the inflammatory cascade associated with COVID, for example. So, And this is the same woman who later in this interview, I'm quite sure, will tell us that ketogenesis is bad, okay? Bad, okay? When it produces the same stuff in a much higher level than the fermentation of a very small amount of plant fibre could ever do in the colon, because we basically don't have much of an ability to do that at all. Fascinating, isn't it? The sheer mental gymnastics, the, the cognitive dissonance, the, the complete divorce from objective reality. Butyrate's controlling inflammation in the body. Other metabolites interact with our immune system. So 70% of our immune cells live in our, in our bowel, in our colon. Yes. And your gut bacteria are constantly interacting with them. Yes. And we also produce 95% of the body's serotonin in the gut. Yes. Which links to our brain health, our mental health, and how we're feeling. Yes. So your gut is constantly interacting with the rest of your body. Yes, we get it. And it's physically, chemically, and hormonally connected to yes. all the other systems in your body. Wow. That's a lot going on. <laughs> Do any <laughs> patients come to mind, or have you have you seen any stories where someone has had like quote bad gut health, and then it's been transformed into good good gut health, and then their whole life has changed? Like, I wonder if you can kind of paint paint one of those pictures for us. Yes, tell us some anecdotes. Oh my god, yeah! Every week in clinic, it's transformative for people, and you know we've been lucky enough to showcase some of that on the recent Channel Four show that I've been on, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. But just uh, if you imagine somebody who cannot control their stools, so their gut health and potentially their rectal muscles, for example, are badly damaged by maybe childbirth or just by the aging process, and so everything that they put in the top end, they're constantly fearing having incontinence, faecal incontinence in a supermarket, on the bus, wherever they go. Yeah, there are people who have faecal incontinence for a number of reasons. Great anecdote. Um, great story. Next time, perhaps a bit more emphasis on the dragons and write a decent ending for goodness sake. Oh, and to be clear with you, this isn't just old people. This happens to young people. People of all ages and stages of their life can experience this for all sorts of different reasons. I think that's probably the biggest example of where what I do as a dietitian can make the biggest difference. Because if we can help someone to control their bowels so they're no longer fearing having an accident, that obviously has a huge impact on their quality of life. And it's not just things like that. You know, we can get people out of pain through adjusting their diet. If you've got kind of problems with the structure of your bowel, something like diverticular disease, for example, which is a super common condition, unfortunately, it creates. Yes, but what causes that, love? What causes diverticulitis? Or diverticulosis, even? Do you even know? I would suggest you probably don't. Because if you did, you'd probably give very different advice to what you do give to people. It creates problems with the structure of the bowel, and that can create a great deal of pain when you're eating particular foods. So we can adjust the diet and get people out of physical pain. And often when I'm working with patients who have things like inflammatory bowel disease, I'll say to them, look, I... Yes, and what's the cause of that? 
can't cure your IBD. I can't cure your Crohn's disease. Or That's your- funny. Because there are many, many professionals who actually understand human physiology, human nutritional requirements, human anthropology, human organ systems, bowel function, etc., who absolutely can help people to cure all of those conditions, ameliorate them entirely. You, you, you're claiming, and and you are being lauded as the UK's premier expert in this, and you're saying you can't do that. Goodness. Goodness. That's concerning, isn't it, everybody? Your ulcerative colitis, but I can probably help you to get out of pain and reduce the symptoms. All right, so you, like most so-called medical, so-called professionals, you focused clearly, solely, on dealing with symptomology rather than actually underpinning etiology and sorting the situation out permanently for somebody. I see. And for them, that's perfect. That's all they're asking for. They're not looking to me to try and- Just give me the pill, doc. Good. And fix the problem. They just want some symptom management that they're not necessarily getting. Right, so you're actually explicitly acknowledging that. You don't have the first clue how to solve the situation. You are dealing with symptomology. Okay, good medically and yeah those are the sorts of things that we deal with every week in clinic and i guess ibs is probably the biggest one that we see a lot yeah, and what causes that of and that is less debilitating for some people but for some people it's incredibly debilitating with really painful bloating and and gas and things like that which they find very difficult yeah okay so let's say let's say someone's listening to this and they're thinking hmm maybe i have a problem with my gut but i'm not really like what I, a lot of people do what are the sorts of signs and symptoms that someone who doesn't is not is not diagnosed with like inflammatory bowel disease or something might have to make them think, huh? Maybe I, I should see a dietitian. Yeah, great question. Anybody that thinks maybe I should see a dietitian is badly misguided. That's a mistake. A dietitian is the last person you should consult about anything regarding your health as that relates to your dietary intakes in any way. The last person in the world you should talk to about that. Mark my words. They will not help you long term. They might, might be able to assist you short term with symptomology a bit. But that's it. If you want someone to help you sort your issues out permanently, perhaps you should talk to someone like myself. That's worth considering. So I would say what's helpful is to start with what's normal because we don't talk about poo, right? So people don't know what's normal. And what we found in general is kind of actually people just might... Who's to say what's normal in terms of human fecal function, bowel function? Who's to say that what is normal is optimal? It's not. It's not remotely anywhere close to optimal, actually, species-specific and in line with our genetic gift, the anthropology of how humans have developed over the last roughly four and a half million years. Go on, though. Tell us what's normal. I live with symptoms that they don't actually have to live with, but they just get used to them, partly because they're embarrassed to talk to anyone about it, but also they've never checked what's normal. So in terms of normal bowel function, we would say that anything between, so passing stool, anything between three times a day and three times a week is... Wow. Three times a day? Normal? Maybe. Optimal? No. The only time you're going to be passing stool three times a day is if you're piling tons and tons and tons of completely indigestible slop down your stupid neck three, four, and five times a day, every day of your life, and getting absolutely just about nothing out of it nutritionally. Why would, why would you suggest for a moment that that much waste is remotely optimal by virtue of implying that it's optimal by saying it's normal? Do you, do you see where we're going with this, kids? Is normal. If that changes for you, so for example, you start off being a three times a day person and suddenly you're a three times a week. Who shits three times a day? Seriously? Are you kidding me? Wow. 
person, that's when you need to get some help. Something's not quite right there. So we call that. So if you stop shitting three times a day, you need help. Is that the message? That seems to be the message. Change in bowel habit. And I'm not talking about having diarrhea occasionally because you've eaten something the night before or had too much to drink. I'm talking about it being consistent. So over about a two week period, if you notice your bowel habits change significantly for you, that's the time to go and get some help. This consistency of your stool is the next thing to think about. So what we're looking for is kind of like a smooth sausage shaped poo that holds together when it goes into the toilet itself. So most of the time, that's kind of what we want. Most people will be somewhere either end of that spectrum fluctuating between the two. So sometimes it's too hard, sometimes it's too soft, and that's okay as long as kind of your median, your median range is kind of in that soft sausage snake-like poo territory. Um, and then we think about kind of wider symptoms beyond that. So things like urgency, for example, if you notice that you, when you need a poo, you really have to rush and you are worried about that and it comes on very suddenly, for example, that's when you could get some help. If you find that your poo is really hard and difficult to pass and you're feeling uncomfortable or you're developing hemorrhoids or piles or you're getting anal... fissures, so like tears in the bottom. Those are things that we could help people with for sure. Um, and then if you think the colour of your poo might be a bit funny, it's an interesting thing to talk about, but the colour of your poo needs to be like a medium brown colour is normal. Occasionally you might eat loads of sweet potato and it might be a bit more orange, or you might have a green smoothie and it might be a bit more green. That's fine. You shouldn't do either of those things, by the way. But as an average, if it's kind of a medium brown colour, that's great. And we don't want it to actually be ridiculously smelly. So if your poo is like really foul smelling, we would think that maybe you're not absorbing everything from your food and that's something to look at. Yes, which is very, very common if you eat things that are not digestible, for example. Or you might have a really affected microbiome that needs some work. If you've got loads of gas that's really uncomfortable for you. Yeah, what's the biggest cause of gas in someone's colon, by the way? Oh, yeah. You and or it's particularly smelly. That's the time that we can do some things to make that better for you. If you've got any abdominal pain at all, really important time to get some help. See, the thing about animal flesh, the muscle meat of animals and associated fat is that almost none of that makes it to the colon at all. It's absorbed in the meters and meters of small intestine. There is basically nothing to pass to the colon under most circumstances if that's all you're eating. So the stuff that produces gas, bloating and problems in the gut are the stuff in that colon that shouldn't be there, stuff that the human body cannot absorb. Good, I think we're getting somewhere. Okay. Even if it's that kind of pain that you're thinking, oh, you know, it comes and goes, I think it's probably okay. Definitely go and chat to somebody about that because there's things that we can do to make it better. So in terms of normal and things that you could get help with, I think that kind of covers the basics of, of what people might be living with and just putting up with that actually they could get some help with. And that are probably signs that something's not quite right in terms of their gut health. As, as you were describing the snake-like snake, -like, uh, snake uh, sausage consistency, I was thinking that my poo was often a lot softer than that until I started taking the Heights pro pre prebiotic probiotic nice. that yeah. tablet thing. Yeah, uh, and now I'm always surprised that like, oh, this looks like a normal poo. It looks Great. like what I think a normal poo is. Um, that's been what I would suggest to anyone who has any kind of issue with their bowel function is that over the next six to eight weeks, you should transition slowly, glacially, steadily to whatever your diet is now to a fully 100% carnivore diet. Don't change your diet overnight. Do it slowly as described. And then give yourself six months eating nothing but muscle meat, primarily of large ruminant animals such as beef, um, associated fat, additional fat in the form of butter, tallow, lard, salt and water, rinse and repeat, and then come back to me and tell me about your bowel function having done that. That'll be interesting. What's next? Nice. Um, what if someone feels like they, their who is normal based on all these kind of parameters that we've mm -hmm. talked about? Is there any reason for someone with normal poo to be thinking about their like diet and nutrition in that sense? Like are there other optimizations that 
healthy people without gut problems can make to improve like productivity, performance, that kind of thing. Yes, there absolutely are. And a dietitian is the last person in the world you should ask about that because they have no idea on that whatsoever. Yeah, for sure. So if, if your gut is not quite working optimally, then that can, even though you might not have any specific symptoms, it can still have an impact on your mental health and your mental performance, right? So your gut is such an integral part of your whole body system. Okay, you've said that already, remember? ecosystem. And inevitably, if it's not happy, it's going to be screaming at your brain all the time. And that is noisy and difficult for your brain to cope with. And that can lead to things like brain fog and struggling with focus and concentration, for example. Similarly... Also, it might lead to things like symptoms that are typically um, diagnosed, perhaps inappropriately on a case-by-case basis as ADHD, innumeracy, dyslexia, those kind of issues, perhaps. Who knows? That can happen. If your gut isn't happy, but you don't really know from other symptoms, but you're getting loads of bugs, infections, viruses all the time, you notice you're really susceptible, that's a good time to start looking at your gut health. Sure. But you shouldn't speak to a dietitian about that because they have no idea how to advise you. And I think, I guess, for this audience, what's really important to recognise is this connection between your gut and your brain. Yes, you've said that, remember? Multiple times already. Brain fog at all and how they are constantly communicating with each other for better or worse. So there is a very strong line of communication. Yes, you've said that. Between your gut and your brain, which we refer to as the gut-brain axis. And again, they are chemically connected through neurotransmitters that are produced in the gut. They are hormonally connected by the HPA axis, and they are physically connected by the vagus nerve. And the chattiest organ between your brain and your gut is your gut. Your gut is constantly telling your brain all sorts of different things and throwing messages up that it's got to deal with. And people might think, oh, it's your brain, your gut's not really doing anything, but actually your brain is busy and it's communicating and it's a lot through those microbes that live in your colon. Sick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're very good at this. <laughs> no, she isn't, matey. No. Thanks. Not my first time. <laughs> You've got the whole like, <laughs> I'm just like, wow. <laughs> oh, God, really? <laughs> um, so w- what can I do, for example, uh, as, a, as a proxy for people listening to this? My poo is fine once a day, you know, medium brown color, not overly smelly, I think, <laughs> but everyone likes the smell of their own poo. Yeah, your shit stinks too, pal. A lot of people think that shit doesn't stink. It does. Apparently. <laughs> um, but oh, obviously I want to kind of maximize my performance and my focus. And actually one question we, we get so often from our audience is people struggling to focus. And sure. I think often people are like, I, I struggle to focus with my schoolwork or with my whatever web design side hustle. I must have ADHD as like an immediate option. But I wonder if there's yeah. gut stuff we can do before we get to that point. Yeah, definitely. I mean, your gut health is, so because your, your gut is constantly communicating with your brain. You have said that multiple times already. I mean, again, if your gut is not happy, things are communicating differently. You've said that. But also you could just not be producing enough serotonin for various different reasons, or your gut might not be sending the right signals up to your brain. So you might have, if we looked at your microbiome, and it's certainly not necessary to do that, we can do this in clinic without testing. But if we looked at your microbiome... Oh, right. So you can just guess entirely. Good. Fantastic. We might find that you've just not got enough of these bacteria that are doing this. Well, hang on. How, how, how do you know if somebody doesn't have enough bacteria? Number one, if you're going to guess without testing completely. And number two, given that we don't know what should be in someone's gut. We have associations of all sorts of different kinds of microbiota, which are healthy and peaceable and possessed by people who are apparently without disease or symptomology. But that's all we have. No, no, let's just guess. Great. Awesome particular important job with brain connection stuff. Um, so what we would suggest then is to really optimize the gut. And well, how do you do that if you're just guessing, love? Please tell me how you optimize anything by guessing completely. You know, what happens, Ali, as you know, is when people are busy and they're working too hard and they're doing a side hustle and everything else is high pressure or they've got a family and everything else, people tend to make their diet quite small, in, not necessarily in terms of volume, but the types of... Some people clearly don't keep their diet small in terms of volume, do they? Do they, Sophie? Tell us about it. Foods that they're eating. So they might end up eating the same types of foods on repeat. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Given that human beings, like every other animal on the planet, has evolved in a specific niche to specialize in gaining its nutrition from a limited source of, of nutrient. 
that being the muscle meat and associated fat of large ruminant animals mostly. Good. What I see is people, there's kind of two camps here, the people who do like the meal prep stuff and they eat the same foods five days a week and they think they're being super healthy. Well, they probably are if they're eating the right thing. If they're eating the wrong thing, it doesn't matter whether they're eating a very small amount of the wrong things or a large amount, a balanced amount of the wrong things, it's still the wrong things. That's the important factor here. Not variety. Variety is not required or important. Eating sweet potato and broccoli every day. No, that's a bad idea. Or you have the people who are just living meal to meal, prep, you know, itsy, wherever they're going every day, the same sorts of things, but just various different places and nothing's particularly planned or thought through. It doesn't really need planning if you know what you're eating pretty much every day. I spend very little energy myself on planning, meals, nutrition, etc. We know what it is in this house. We prepare it, or somebody does. It's not me. It's herself that prepares it. And I sit down and say, thank you very much. Yum, yum, yum. It's great. And inevitably, both of those ways of eating have an impact on your gut health. Unless I've pissed her off that day, in which case, let's look after yourself, Charlie Brown. That happens sometimes too. Whether you feel it in your gut or not. So that way of eating limits the types of fibres that your gut bacteria are being fed. And the most important thing for your gut health is... You don't need to feed your gut fibre at all. Not one single gram of fibre is required in the human diet ever. None at all. You're eating 30 different plants a week, so trying you, to eat... You don't need to eat any plants at all, let alone 30. None. Loads of variety of different types of plants. You, well, you don't need to do that. That's a bad idea because that will give you loads of variety of different anti-nutrients, toxins, pro-inflammatory substrates, and damaging fibre. That's the worst thing you could possibly do. That includes fruit and veg, but also nuts and whole grains, different types of grains. We're super fixated in this country on like oats and wheat, but actually there's so many different types of grains that our gut really benefits from. No, there aren't any at all. Your gut does not benefit from grains, not one jot. No. So when you're busy and you're struggling and you're eating meal to meal or you're eating the same foods on repeat. I'm busy, very busy. Not struggling. Not struggling at all with my bowel function or gas or discomfort or pain or any aspect of bowel function in any way. It seems to be optimal. And I eat basically nothing but the flesh and associated fat of large ruminant animals with very little of anything that isn't that. Have done for eight and a half years. I know several people who have been doing that for multiple decades and who seem to be pretty optimal in terms of their health, function, and all of that. It's almost as if we know something that you don't seem to know, Sophie. Don't seem to know at all. What happens is your gut health, your gut sort of function might not change, but your gut health is inevitably not optimized. And that's when you can have these problems with lack of concentration, focus, energy, getting bugs all the time, that kind of stuff. Yeah, you said that. And really interestingly, your gut bacteria communicate with your hypothalamus, so that bit of your brain that... Oh my God, really? The guts com communicate with the brain, do they? You haven't said that before, have you? Controls things like cortisol production. So really early in your life, your gut bacteria dictate where your sort of HPA axis is set, so how much cortisol you release in under given circumstances. Yes, there's a hysteresis, absolutely. Circumstances. And we all need some cortisol, right? But we don't want loads and loads of cortisol because we've got loads of anxiety and stress all the time. We can really struggle to concentrate and to focus. So we can use our gut bacteria. And, and to remember what you've already said, for example, or manage your own body composition even remotely effectively, perhaps. Who knows, that could occur. We to try and reduce that and make things a little bit better in that department. We can use them and harness their powers to get more serotonin, which helps us with better sleep and concentration and focus and all those important things, those happy hormones. Again, no problems with any of those things either. And we can also just try and calm down those messages from our... The Grumpy Professor Act is just that, by the way. I'm very, very happy, actually, in my Brand X life off the camera. I have a great sense of humour. I enjoy life a great deal. and. Um, you know, there is much to there is much to take joy in. So yes, please don't take the act too seriously. Take the information seriously, because it's all very good, scientifically robust things that I'm saying here. Absolutely. Um, Sophie, carry on. 
gut to our brain, which are distracting our brain all the time. And your gut bacteria are going to be saying, we need more plants. And you're going to be not reading that properly and giving them more sushi. And that's not quite... You don't need more plants. Absolutely. And sushi is probably not a very good idea. In fact, it almost certainly is not a good idea. Okay. what they want. Wow. So... It sounds like you're saying, and please correct me if this is an oversimplification, that changing up what you eat can have a massive impact on your focus, productivity, performance, happiness. Absolutely. He's quick, isn't he? He's really quick on the uptake, this bloke. That's why he's a doctor, clearly, because he, he gets the message. Okay. Because really? all of those yeah. things are linked, gut, brain, everything. Yeah, fundamentally. I mean, and proven in amazing research and science, yeah. Amazing research and science. Tell us about it. What kind of research has been done on this? I oh, guess I, good, good question. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking he healthy people rather than people with official gut problems. Yes. Official ones, yes. So uh, the amazing work of John Cryan is a really good place to, to start looking at. Amazing work, good. This stuff if people are interested. And he's written an amazing book called The Amazing Psy Book. Psychobiotic Revolution. So psychobiotics are these gut bacteria that communicate with our brain. So Really? You haven't mentioned that before. They're the ones that we're particularly interested in when we develop the height smart probiotic, for example. So work that's been done in that area to start with in rodent models. Ah, good. Well, uh, next time I'm talking to a rodent about its gut health, I'll be sure to mention your probiotic, prebiotic mixtures that you're selling to people on the basis that they're associated with something or other in rodents. They used a, a model of an autistic mouse. And oh, an aut how do you diagnose a mouse is autistic? Do you give it a questionnaire perhaps? Is that what you do? <laughs> wow, fantastic, good. A model of a non-autistic mouse. So yes, a non-autistic mouse, one that has no signs of autism. Because autism is basically diagnosed through the way that an, uh, that a person, not an animal, interacts sociologically, and and we can assess their thought patterns and behaviours because we can communicate with other humans. We, did you notice we can't communicate with other animals? We don't know their language. We certainly can't give them a written questionnaire about their autism. This is great, isn't it, boys and girls? Tell us more about science, though, please sociable mouse. And they took the microbiome, so they took a sample and, and gave the microbiome of the autistic mouse to the sociable mouse. But, ah, right. So a mouse that's not sociable is autistic. Good. Great sciencing. Love it. And the sociable mouse starts to show autistic traits. You, you mean is less sociable? Maybe because it's unwell because its guts are now upset, perhaps? Did you ask it? No? Doesn't seem to be very great sciencing then, does it? Okay. And when <laughs> sure, if you like. They swap them over, the autistic mouse starts to become a sociable mouse. Oh, you mean it starts feeling better and therefore is not so grumpy and is more happy to interact with its fellow mices, mice and mouses? Good. Just because it's got microbiome has changed. No. That's that's a cause and effect claim you've just made on the basis of no ability to make such a claim. Good. So that was the early work that they did trying to understand yeah, how amazing work, remember? It was amazing. How much our gut microbiome is impacted. No, no, a mouse's microbiome, not a person. See, a study about meses, mices, and mouses is about them, not us, okay? Impacting our mental health. No, not ours, and neither the mouses, because you can't ask the mouse about it. It's great sciencing. It's performance, how our brain is working. No. So similar studies to that have then been replicated in humans. No because there was completely different diagnostic criteria when talking about humans' experience of the universe because we can communicate with other humans, unlike meses, mices, and mouses. Okay. In other places. And to be clear, that autistic spectrum disorder stuff in humans is so complex. So we're going to call autism a disorder, are we? Big it. And we can't replicate that exactly in humans as yet, but there's certainly something going on there, which is what we generally learn from robots. Oh, well, there's something going on, so it must be good science. Amazing science. Good. I'm glad that you've been reading amazing science about something might be going on in Mises. Studies. We've also got some great data showing. Oh, great data. Awesome. Tell us about the great data. Things like increase in production of serotonin when we use particular probiotic species. Yeah, is that necessarily indicated though? There's great data showing that. Great data, yes. 
using particular probiotic species within treatment diets and things like that, so within treatment within uh, studies, in controlled studies, improves anxiety, depression, all of these kinds of symptoms. Uh, as measured how exactly? And why do nutrients within this work? And is that just an association or is it cause and effect? And if so, how do you explain away every other potential compound, covariate or collinearity that was not actually controlled in such studies whatsoever that underpins the claim as a mixed, rich tapestry, a hard-baked outcome? without any ability to inform on cause and effect whatsoever. Because that's what a scientist would do. They would mention that. Okay? Old, if we think about things like omega-3s and B vitamins, they've been used in place of anxiety and depression medications, SSRIs, that kind of stuff. Sure. And they work as effectively in some people some of the time. So either the vitamin supplementation is very effective or the common gold standard treatment of SSRIs, et cetera, is not, or both. Which is it? Mm, interesting, isn't it, kiddies? I'm in studies, so we can use all of these things. And a sim similar work has been done with the two, stra one, two of the strains we use in the smart probiotic in terms of seeing whether they work as effectively as common anti-depression, anti-anxiety medications. Right, which don't work very well. So <laughs> it's not a great claim, is it? And they do. So, right, so poorly. Awesome. Much so that there's health claims on them in Canada that people can say these are definitely shown to improve anxiety and depression. I measured how? Still. So there's great data. It's Again, is there? Because great is not a scientific word. If there is data, why don't you give us the data and we can decide for ourselves, being competent scientists and of competent faculty of scientific thought, to make that assessment for ourselves as to whether it's great. Because you're really right behind things that claim to be great, aren't you? Things may be advertised by cartoon tigers that say things are great, perhaps. We'll get to that later, though. Carry on. It's a young field of research, but it's super exciting. And it's super exciting. Another great scientific word. Super exciting. Yes. Very solid research. Just no, it isn't. Nonsense showing that the magic that we can harness. No, no, magic is also not science. It's the antithesis, love. No? Okay, shall we move on? From my gut. You're doing well, though. You're doing a great job at, I don't know what, but you're not doing a great job necessarily about being scientific or giving us a robust and accurate view of what the science is able to inform on or not. And you may or may not be doing a great job on managing your own health. Who knows? Nice. <laughs> um... <laughs> Sweet. So clearly there's a lot going on. Uh, one of the things- You've said that before on things. Is, is that your standard response for things that you don't understand at all? Perhaps, who knows? You said, um, nice actionable takeaway for me and anyone listening to this. 30 different plants a week. I know. Yeah, that's a bad idea. That, you know, that's 30 more than you should take in, in a week. That's a lot. <laughs> it sounds- that's 30 too many. It's like a lot, but actually if you break it down into days, you're looking for about five different plants a day. No, you're not. You're looking for none at all, in fact, because biologically you're a human being and human beings are obligate hypercarnivores. The smallest amount of plant material possible, the better, it seems. We'll cover that later, though, if it becomes relevant in this chat. I'm sure it will, because I'm sure we're going to say a lot more things that are also just as brilliant, stunning, amazing, great and outstanding. So what you would say is like, for example, for breakfast. No, 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 no. I wouldn't say anything remotely similar to anything you're likely to say, love, ever. You had like a multi-grain cereal. Well, that's a good idea. No, it isn't. Grains are pro-inflammatory, colon function destroying, um, lectin-ridden, oxalate-ridden nonsense. Very, very toxic, very, very deleterious, quite demonstrably to gut function and health overall in people. Not a good idea. Whole grain cereal. Yeah, you get bad idea. Very, very bad idea. You can have loads of different in there, in there. Chuck some seeds in, chuck some nuts in. Oh, right. So some more lectins and some more oxalate and some more phytates and 
probably some tannic acids if you're going to throw in a few other things as well. Why don't you throw in some deadly nightshade while you're there? Not to mention the, the deleterious, the, the clearly deleterious effect of the fiber on gut function, both mechanically and pro inflammatory wise. No? Okay. And chuck some dried fruit in. I love fruit. Dried fruit. So let's concentrate the, the, the problematic aspects of the fruit, i.e., let's make the fiber even more unlikely to be actually even accessible to any fermentation at all because it's dehydrated now. Uh, let's let's furthermore concentrate the fructose and the sucrose, both of which are utterly contraindicated in the human diet. Good, good. What's next? Freeze-dried berries, amazing. Chuck some of that stuff in. And yeah, actually- no, don't do that at all. That, that will destroy your gut function and really, really wreck your health long term. Who knows, in the short term, you might even end up bloated, corpulent, at least grossly overweight, if not obese, perhaps. That could happen to a given individual who eats that way, potentially. Sophie? Actually, you're kind of already there with at least five different plants in there. Yeah, and you're already probably 90% of the way of destroying your gut function and almost ensuring that your long-term health will be compromised and probably probably your lifespan as well, to be fair, if you actually are remotely sensible and can put two and two together here. Then at lunchtime, maybe between your lunch and your breakfast, you could have a handful of nuts there. Mm, Perhaps you could. Uh, That would also, however, be a very, very bad idea and, and, and people shouldn't do that. Lunchtime, make sure you're having at least a couple of different veg in there. No, 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 vegetables, no. Vegetables are not your friend. They are, they are not going to increase your health or gut function in any way, actually. Maybe chuck some seeds on top. You know, again with the seeds? No. And then in the afternoon, you want to have some fruit as a snack? And then the- no, you don't. No, you see, you're, you're vastly grossly short on the flesh, by which I mean muscle meat and associated fat of large ruminant animals so far. You're talking all about eating the very things that human beings are absolutely utterly should do no such thing. Great work, Sophie. Great work. Evening, make sure you're having some veg. Like actually, if you spread it out like that. Actually, if you say actually before something, it's correct. Those are the rules. That's the law, apparently. It's totally achievable for people. unless you Sure, do- you can achieve poisoning yourself slowly to death. Absolutely, it's doable. Does that mean you should? I don't know. Actually, I do know, but... You know. Doing one of these funny restrictive diets that... A restrictive diet? No. Appropriate diet. Okay, restriction is not a bad thing. If you're restricting toxins, anti-nutrients, pro-inflammatory substances, contraindicated fiber and sugars and starches, that's not restrictive. It's like saying, oh, I'm on a, I'm on a cyanide-restricted diet. It's a contraindicated restricted diet because it's restricted of cyanide. Okay? You shouldn't eat cyanide. The same is true of plant materials. Okay? You know, nobody would recommend anyway. Who cares what anyone would recommend if they don't know what they're talking about? Sophie. All right, we're just going to take a quick break from the podcast to introduce our sponsor, which is very excitingly Huel. I have been a paying customer of Huel since 2017, so it's been about six years now that I've been using Huel fairly regularly. I started eating Huel in my fifth year of medical school, and I've been using Huel regularly ever since because, you know, I like to be productive. I, you know, my calendar is full with a lot of things, and often I don't have the time or don't make the time to have a particularly healthy breakfast or a particularly healthy lunch. My favorite flavor is salted caramel because for 400 calories, you get 40 grams of protein, which is absolutely insane and you also get a decent healthy mix of carbohydrates and fiber and fat a lot you really are a fucking idiot aren't you yeah along with 26 different vitamins and minerals, which are all very good for the body. There's nine different flavors of this to choose from. My favorite is a the banana version and also the salted caramel version. So what I do is I take my two scoops. Oh, wow. Incredible, isn't it? them into my Nutribullet blender type thing, although you can just use a normal shaker. Yes, I mean, look at all the cave paintings of, of ancient humans putting things in blenders and all the paintings of plant material and salads and stuff. If you want, I mix it right beside the images of hunting men diving headlong at woolly mammoths with their mouths open so that they can tear their throats open with their sharp pointy teeth, by the way. 
it up normally with water, but a little bit of milk to add a bit more of a milkshake-like consistency to it. And then I just sip that while I'm on my desk doing my work in the morning. And it ensures that I get a very healthy breakfast in. That's no, it does no such thing. No such thing at all. In fact, no. Look at those, look at those healthy, what are they? Cinnamon rolly thingsy with the healthy sugar on top there and the, you know, goodness, the, the healthy starches and sugars in there. And mm, mm. no animal products must be healthy. Absolutely. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. Nutritionally complete. No. I don't see any animal products. It's not nutritionally complete. Okay rather than some high sugar cereal, which is what I would have defaulted to instead. They're great! So Huel is ridiculously reasonably priced. Uh, like, just ridiculous is what it is, in fact. A meal for 400 calories comes out to- Calories are heat energy. You, you can't consume heat energy at all. It's impossible. Physiologically, physically, but it's against the laws of physics. You can't do that. One pound 68 per meal, which is super, super cheap compared to what the alternative would be if you were ordering takeout for it. It depends. Uh, how much value do you place on your health? Because fuel won't be the answer for your health, unless poor health is what you're looking for. Example. Anyway, if you like the idea of getting these cheap and healthy and nutritionally- and They're not healthy, in, in fact, at all. And, and then neither are they nutritionally complete. I can guarantee you that complete meals in your diet, then head over to heal.com forward yeah, don't do that. slash deep dive. And if you use that URL, heal.com forward slash deep dive, they will send you a free t-shirt, which are quite nice. Oh, well, bonus. Yes. And also a free kind of shaker or bottle type thing with your Ooh. first order. So thank you so much, Heal, for sponsoring this episode. This episode is very kindly brought to you by Trading212. I thought now it was brought to us by Heal. Which is it? People ask me all the time for advice about investing because I've made a bunch of videos about it on the YouTube channel. And my advice for most people is generally invest in broad stock market index funds, which Again, balance is good. Is exactly what you can do completely for free with Trading212. It's a great app that lets you trade stocks and funds and ETFs and foreign exchange if you're Does it let you lose money if you make a bad investment? Does it do that? you want to. And one of the great things about the app is that if you're new to the world of investing, you can actually invest with fake money. You don't have- Oh, to brilliant. <laughs> awesome. Uh, just like you can invest in your health with fake nutrition. Good stuff. Put real money in. They've got a practice mode where you invest fake money and then it actually tracks what the market is doing in real time. So you can see, had I invested a hundred pounds into this thing, what would my return have been? X weeks or X months further down the line. Once you've got some- Shame nutrition doesn't work that way as well, huh? Comfort with that, then it's super easy to deposit money into your trading 212 account. You can use Apple Pay, like I do initially, or you can use a direct bank transfer. And then once the money is in your trading 212 account, then you can invest it in basically whatever you want. And uh, you can lose it real quickly if you want to, a lot. If you're based in the UK, you might be familiar with the concept of an ISA, which is an individual savings account, which is basically a tax-free wrapper that you can put money in. You can put £20,000 in every year, up to £20,000, and it resets every April, and then all that money can grow, and it's completely tax-free for the rest of your life. And if you want to sign up for an ISA, you can sign up for one completely for free, also on Trading212. So if you haven't yet filled up your ISA allowance, or at least put some money into your ISA for this year, that might be a good step forward. The app also lets you auto-invest, which is a great thing, because then you can automatically invest a percentage of your paycheck into the thing every month. Month. And so if you haven't yet stopped- Wow! Wow! <gasps> I wouldn't be doing that. ...started with investing and you want to give it a go, then you can download the app on the App Store, and if you use the coupon code ALI, A-L-I, at the checkout, that will give you a totally free share worth up to £100. It's available on iPhone and Android, and you can check it out by typing in Trading212 into your respective App Store. So thank you so much, Trading212, for sponsoring this episode. Yeah, at the moment I'm trying to do a sort of high-protein, low-calorie thing to cut with my- you can't do low calorie. You can't have any effect on calories. Calories cannot be absorbed by the human body. Neither can they be spent by the human body or used or burned. Calories are heat energy and nothing else. Shall we move on? A health coach and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but, you know, his, his thing is like, you know, at least for a while, let's just try and eat the same thing every day broadly so that you know what's coming into your body and then we can see how that affects your weight, all that kind of stuff. I mean, you can see me cringing, right? Yeah. <laughs> So, who cares? Absolutely yeah. terrible advice. So, I coming from you, love, that's amazing. The sheer, I mean, the Dunning Kruger, just, Dunning Kruger, just drips from every pore, doesn't it, love? For those that don't know what that is, Dunning Kruger is the syndrome shown by people who 
are so destitute of competence that they are unaware of their own incompetence. They think they know stuff. Wow. Wow. Usually those kind of people also don't either own too many mirrors or look in them very often. I think you'll find. I, literally, I, I've got some questions. Literally. Literally. That, that strengthens what you're about to say in what way, love? At all. Sent planned for this week around what terrible advice I see from personal trainers. Oh, you've literally got it planned. Is that any different from you've got it planned? Whatever you're planning leads you to believe would be a good idea to say to people. The fact that you've literally planned it makes it so much better, does it, in some way? Okay. I'm hmm. sure your guy knows what he's doing in terms of personal training. I'm quite sure he probably doesn't. But the worst things that personal trainers do, there's three things I see them doing regularly to people. One is... Tell us all about how bad personal trainers are, dietitian. Go on. Putting them on the same foods on repeat. Because well, that's not necessarily a bad thing, so long as the foods that they put them on on repeat are the right ones for human beings, which I think I've been quite clear about already what that is. You're starving off your essential gut bacteria. Really? Essential gut bacteria? Which ones are those, love? And you're going to back that up with anything? Let's, let's hear the science on that. That's what I thought you'd say. Yeah, and some of those really important gut bacteria are... At well, hang on. Which is it? Essential or important? And if so, what determines their importance and what science underpins that? Again, that's what I thought you'd say actually protecting you from obesity oh well protection protection <laughs> protection from obesity you say sophie protection from obesity okay well number one uh and number two protection is a cause and effect statement isn't it to protect something infers that we know and can predict what will occur in a given individual protection which, which evidence are you going to point to for that claim? Same again. Good, good. So they're working to help you to control your body weight. And so are they? Are they indeed, love? Are they? I see. <laughs> Back to my comment earlier about mirrors, perhaps. If you're starving them, you're making your life much more difficult in the long run. Really, are you? Really? Much more difficult, you say? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it's like this really low fiber diet typically. Yeah, so that's a good thing because fiber is contraindicated in the human colon. It's counterproductive, it destroys colonic function, it's associated with so called idiopathic constipation, anal bleeding, um, anal fissures, hemorrhoids, loose gap junctions, leaky gut syndrome, chronic systemic inflammation, and, and all the sequelae involved in that, actually. Whereas you talk to someone who eats a sensible carnivorous diet, and you'll find no such issues exist. Okay. And so that's just as a measure of them cutting out carbohydrates. Nobody's looked to check because they don't know what they don't know, right? That's no right. So if a lot of people don't know what they don't know, it's called Dunning-Kruger. I think I've been clear on that already in this video. And unlike you, I don't have the need to repeat myself every three seconds because I forgot what I said and stuff. Once check that there's at least 30 grams of fiber in no, there. You don't need any fiber whatsoever. Not one single gram ever. The exact dietary requirement for fiber in human beings is none. And which is what we all need every no, day. No, it isn't, Sophie. False. A, for healthy, to, for healthy stools and a healthy... No, it, no, in fact, the exact opposite appears to be true. There's only one even remotely pseudo-clinical study available on this. It's covered very eloquently by Dr. Paul Mason on the YouTubes. Just look up Dr. Paul Mason and Fiber, and you'll find it. It's not hard. Okay. You go and educate yourself on this, Sophie, seriously. Bell, usually they're around 16 grams of fiber when we calculate them. It's just half of what we need. No, it's not. That's 16 grams more than you need, in fact, because you still need none at all. Not one single gram ever, still. Um, and then the other thing is having loads of red meat or loads of animal pro products generally. Yeah, the very thing we've evolved on over four and a half million years. Yeah, what about it? Really? <laughs> so the world. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you know, I ask you, people, would you take health advice from either one of the people 
involved in this discussion? Would you? And if you would, please do, go ahead. It's your funeral. That is Darwin in action. Right there. World Cancer Research Fund says we... Right, so an appeal to authority fallacy. Yeah. Are you going to actually refer to any cause and effect experimental data extant anywhere regarding cancer and nutrition in human beings over any period of time, let alone long term? Are you? Why not? Well, because it doesn't exist. Okay, can we move on? Should we stick with the actual science and what it does actually say, rather than the ideology, the theology, the propaganda, the fearmongery, the smoke and mirrors, the nonsense spewed forth by these absolute ridiculous charlatans? Tell us about some science, Sophie. We're waiting. We should only have three portions of red meat per week. Well, who cares what these people say? It's not underpinned by science. There are millions of human beings who eat vastly more red meat than that, and have done some of them for decades without ill effect. Okay? That's 500 grams, 350 to 500 grams in total. Otherwise, we're putting ourselves in higher total. in total. Otherwise, not, like not every three. day. No, <laughs> 350 to 500 grams total a week. No, that's vastly not enough red meat for a number of reasons. Plenty Otherwise, we're putting ourselves <laughs> at higher risk of that. No, 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 no. There are no studies anywhere, extant anywhere in the literature, that can inform on any aspect of risk as that relates to any aspect of any health outcome, hard health outcome in human beings over any period of time as that relates to any aspect of human nutrition. No such studies exist. False again, Sophie. Or cancer. And so again, these meal plans that people are given actually are starving your gut bacteria, which... No. No, not at all. Encouraging certain species who like certain foods, perhaps. Perhaps starving other speciations, which are not well suited to what you are eating, sure, but that's not starving your gut microbiome. That's starving, perhaps, certain speciations about which you have no research that can tell us what the likely outcomes will be, good, bad, or indifferent, because there are no such studies extant, Sophie. Still. Okay. What's next? So you're at risk of loads of different problems. No, again with the risk word, not at all. False. No. It's putting you at higher risk. Of no. Risk. Not at all. False. Things like cancer. No, not at all. False. Which nobody wants. And all sure, nobody wants cancer, but there are no studies that inform us on the risks of any aspect of nutrition still. So no. Kinds of other things, but it's, it's not. Which other things? You mentioned cancer, and there's no evidence to support that. There's actually no evidence to support any heart health outcome, good or bad, in fact. None. There are no experiments on human beings locked in labs for multiple decades to check on what occurs health outcomes-wise with everything else under control and observation. None. None at all. Okay, what's next? Not the fault of the personal trainer. It's going, circling back to this conversation of nutrition, people in the nutrition space. Yes, what about us? Giving advice on things they just shouldn't really be giving advice. Right, like dietitians, because you, you guys have no business giving advice on, right? advice on nutrition. That's not your field of expertise. Your field of expertise is spouting indoctrinated, theologically based, Propaganda, smoke and mirrors, fearmongery, and spin doctory, not science. We've just seen an example of it right there. Risk, you say, risk, you say, risk, risk, risk. Studies show, you say. No, they don't, Sophie. There are no studies that show anything remotely similar to what you've just suggested that studies show without citing any studies. Did you notice that, boys and girls? Not a single citation to a study. Funny that. I wonder why. Well, I don't wonder why. I know why. What's next? So if you want nutrition advice and tailored specific nutrition advice for but you... Then talk to someone who understands nutrition, and that is not a dietitian. You need to see, we've got an amazing sports dietitian on the team. No, you don't. And again, amazing, are they? Amazing. Dietitians who can tailor all these things for you and give No, you they can't, because all they do is spout ideology. Proper. No, not proper at all. 
unless you're talking about proper gander. Tailored plan that no, that you can actually manage in terms of everything as opposed to just thinking. Oh, good. Well, you, you know how to manage everything. I thought you're just looking after symptoms and poorly, usually, in fact, by giving people poor advice. Good. About that one thing, which is the aesthetics, which everyone gets fixated on. Oh, that's handy. I'll book an appointment with. <laughs> aesthetics, you say, yes. Good. Tell us about aesthetics, Sophie. That'll be good. <laughs> um, <laughs> 30 grams of fiber. What does 30 grams of fiber look like in a It looks diet? like 30 grams too much of fiber. Right. Well, it's about yeah. half of what the average person is getting. Yeah, right. Well, so what? Oh. No, sorry. No, it's about double what the average person is getting. So most people in England. Well, again, so what? England eat less than half of what they actually need in terms no, of. No, no, no. What they need in terms of fiber is still none. None at all. Fiber every day. So most people are getting around 15 grams of fiber a day. So we need to make sure we're adding lots of extra things in. No, Think we don't. We need to do the exact opposite. We need to avoid fiber like the plague, in fact. Things have happened within the social media space that have made that happen. So, for example, people now demonize breakfast cereals where actually. Really? I wonder why. Again, I don't wonder why. Yeah. Loads of us got. They're great! Sugar laden nonsense. Mostly gluten laden nonsense. Pro inflammatory, gut destroying, poisonous, toxic, anti nutrient laden garbage. Not food for human beings. Okay. Loads of fiber from breakfast cereals. Fiber is not a good thing, still. Every day. Women were mainly dependent on breakfast cereals for iron for a long time. And well, I wonder why. Because some buffoon told them to avoid eating red meat. The very place where they actually can get bioavailable and usable iron in the heme format, non-toxic heme iron, as opposed to the toxic elemental iron that they'll find in cereals, which they can't avoid, uh, absorb very much of anyway, and which will absolutely cause them a problem. Good. Slightly different now, but actually we cut these things out because an influencer tells us to, and actually there's consequences for everything that we move around in our diet. Right? Indeed. Like if you eat the wrong kind of diet, Sophie, you might end up corpulent unhealthy looking, overweight, and you might express all sorts of things like so-called ADHD, so-called innumeracy, so-called dyslexia, brain fog, inability to remember what you said five seconds ago, and you'd probably be also the kind of person who might be susceptible to being indoctrinated by a theologically based society who are completely divorced, divorced from reality and unable to inform anybody on science in any way, shape or form. I don't know, Sophie, that's the kind of thing that might happen to a person who eats the wrong kind of diet, those kind of things. Do carry on though, you're doing a great job, tell us all about it. So thinking about where your sources of fibre are, so we're talking- No, making sure that you're not consuming any fibre, which is easy, just don't eat plants, good about whole grains, fruits, no, and bad idea. vegetables, bad idea. nuts and seeds, that bad idea. kind of stuff. Where are your sources of those in your diet? They're not. Eight and a half years. It's amazing. I haven't had a shit in eight and a half years, Sophie. That's right. I've been constipated for eight and a half years because I don't eat fibre. Mm. No. Rick Rodriguez. He must be well backed up. He's been eating a carnival diet for 40 years. And Dr. Anthony Chafee interviewed a woman just in the last couple of weeks who's been a carnival for 67 years, no fibre. She must be well constipated by now. No. Okay, what's next? Could you maximise them? So, for example, swapping white rice for whole grain rice. Is no, just leave rice out of your diet entirely. It's a really great step in the right direction. White no, rice it isn't. Whole grain pasta. If you're having like mince, for example, so minced beef, add some lentils in there. No, just don't do any such thing because that's full of lectins, oxalate, phytic acid, and all sorts of nonsense that will absolutely compromise your health status. Do no such thing. Bulking up the fibre a little bit, leave the skin on your vegetables. No, no, don't eat vegetables at all, especially not the skins. They're the most toxic bit, other than the seeds. On root vegetables, that kind of stuff. Leave the skin on. You get a bit no, no, don't eat the root vegetables and don't eat the skin if you're going to. Preferably. Preferably. Fibre there. You don't need fibre still. Make sure you snack on fruit. Those no, don't do anything such, such thing. That's full of toxic contraindicated carbohydrates and fibre. You don't want to be doing that at all. And things. It's basically the stuff that your mum would have told you to do. When yeah, you well, she was wrong. Sorry about that. And mum only said that because she was told that by someone who was also wrong. 
Okay. Good. It's all that stuff we need to do to try and boost our fibre intake. No, you don't need to boost your fibre intake still. Most people just aren't getting enough. No, wrong. Any fibre at all is too much. What's the deal with breakfast cereal? Oh, my, here we go. My, in, in, uh, my influencer adult understanding is breakfast cereal is bad because lots of sugar and Amer- Correct. American advertising companies convinced us that breakfast... Among the other things. Most important meal of the day. That's BS. We uh, should- correct. Breakfast is not the most important meal of the day. And neither is it important for you to pile toxins, fiber, anti nutrients, sugar, all that kind of nonsense down your neck at any time of the day, let alone in the morning. Okay, what's next? You should all be intermittent fasting <laughs> and just skipping breakfast in the morning anyway, because 16 8 fasting is good for you. So, therefore, breakfast cereal is evil. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear all those things as well. I think the key thing with breakfast. Clearly, you don't, though, love, because you just dismiss those things and laugh as if that's a refutation. It's not, by the way. For cereal is, it can very easily become what we might call an ultra processed food. And that's where it's just got loads of extra additives in it that you wouldn't recognize in your kitchen. No, it- no. Part of processing sometimes means that there are additional additives, but processing actually, Sophie, means the removal of certain aspects, mostly the fiber, which is probably a good thing. Nonetheless, you still, sh- still shouldn't eat the balance, the remainder of grains once the fiber is removed, because that's just as toxic. Actually, you shouldn't be eating plant materials of any kind at all, still. Preservatives, emulsifiers, that kind of stuff. Uh, Lots of extra sugar, salt, all those kinds of things. So we want to avoid those ones. So the ones that look like they're super commercial, we probably want to push them out the window. But you can add things in, in. Tony the Tiger will be very upset by that, Sophie. In terms of making your own sort of breakfast here, you can toast some oats, toast some stuff to make. In fact, that's hate speech against Tony the Tiger. Granola, that kind of stuff. Some of the more natural granolas would be a good choice for you. No. You. But in terms of fasting, there's no evidence of any benefits of fasting. Be- or indeed of anything else nutritionally in terms of hard health outcome over any period of time in human beings. There are mechanistic, short-term, poorly controlled studies that inform somewhat on inferences, but that's all, Sophie. What's your point? Beyond weight control. So there is... Tell us all about weight control though, Sophie. We'll wait for that, shall we? Seriously, I despair sometimes, I really do, as to the, the sheer lack, the sheer incredible lack of self-awareness that a lot of these individuals who talk about this kind of ridiculous nonsense online exhibit. It's incredible. Some reasonable data to show that fasting can improve weight control, but also there's this counteracting data coming through now where people who don't eat enough in the morning and tend to overcompensate and eat much more in the evening. And that's worse for us from a metabolic perspective. We've kind of got this biological night of around 9 p.m. where all of our processing of everything slows right down. So things can sit around in our bloodstream a lot longer and cause more trouble if we're eating too late at night. So, Or if you eat things that are not problematic in the first place, that won't be an issue, will it? Actually, if you're someone who wakes up hungry and you're dragging yourself through till 12... Okay, if you wake up hungry, why is that, Sophie? What has caused that hunger when you wake up? Hmm? No? Okay. O'clock into your eating window and you're feeling terrible, you've got headaches and you feel awful. That's obviously not the right way for you to be eating. Your body, and we're all different from a circadian rhythm perspective, right? Our body clock is all different. So if you're someone who feels hungry in the morning, you should eat in the morning. Just listen to your body, be a normal person. (laughs) Sure, that's fine. If you are someone who just doesn't feel very hungry at night, you might find it easier to finish eating at six o'clock and that might work really well for you. But really importantly, if you're trying intermittent fasting and you notice that you're really loading those calories later in the day. You can't load calories, Sophie. Calories are still heat energy and they're not absorbable, containable or controllable in in the sense that you're talking about it's probably not right for you most studies will show that actually if you studies show which studies would those be sophie which studies are you referring to have some calories in the morning well you can't have calories in the morning because they're still heat energy remember front load your calories a little bit you can't have calories calories are still heat energy you'll reduce your calories later no you won't because they're still heat energy that cannot be consumed the day which is metabolically a bit better for us what about things like 
chicken and fish? What are, like, how much chicken and fish should I be eating? <laughs> Very little. So your body, eighty percent of your intake ought to be the red meat of large ruminant animals and associated fat. Everything else from the animal kingdom makes up the other twenty percent in total. So not very much chicken or fish at all. In fact, the your your bowel doesn't particularly like red meat. It's nonsense. Absolute, utter, complete nonsense. False. Certainly doesn't like processed meat. So the. No, again, with the certainly word, no. There is no study that talks about certainly anything. Even good studies make inferences based on likelihood, not certainty, okay? No. The, the data on processed meat says little, if any, processed meat. No, the data doesn't say anything of the sort. The people who interpret the data according to their own philosophy and their own ideology and their own theology say that. The data says nothing of the sort. The data is just numbers, Sophie. Okay? For protection of bowel cancer. So no, again, with the word protection, that's a cause and effect statement. There are no studies that inform on cause and effect. Still, no. This might be things like sausages, bacon, even things like cured meats, that kind of stuff is just not great for our bowel health. That is a speculation. Um, any animal meat, any, any animal proteins, our body, our bowel can quickly find that too much. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. We evolved over four and a half million years eating almost nothing but the flesh and fat of animals, Sophie. Absolute rubbish. Nonsense. What's next? So a good example that people might recognize is if you ate like a meat feast pizza. Yeah, well, there you go. There's the problem. The pizza part of it. Just eat a meat feast. Forget the pizza part and you'll be fine. Or like had a massively heavy meaty meal. Usually. Like meat by itself. Your gas the next day or later that evening is going to be pretty foul smelling. False. If you are a well-adapted carnivore individual who's eaten nothing but meat and animal fat for months and years on end, in fact, no such thing is true at all. Unless you do eat a pizza, in which case you will have gas because it's the pizza part that causes the gas, Sophie. Okay? And that's because when we have too much animal protein in particular... No. Too much of anything is not indicated, of course, Sophie, absolutely. But how much is too much animal protein? You're suggesting any at all is problematic, which is false. Completely false. It's then some of that leftover protein that we can't absorb and digest is being fermented by really bad types of bacteria. Most surplus protein, in fact, Sophie, is transmuted metabolically to sugar in the first instance and thereafter to triacylglycerol fat. Okay, very little is fermented in the gut because most protein and fat never gets anywhere near the colon. It is all absorbed in the small intestine. All right? Just physiology, though, just facts, just actual science, just actual understanding of the human systems. Unlike your wild, ridiculous fantasies here. Yeah, they're really not good guys that we don't want to be feeding. We don't know who they are in terms of the gut microbiome. The not good guys. Good and bad gut bacteria sits on the same level of veracity and correctness as saying good and bad cholesterol. It's nonsense. Okay, what is next? And when they ferment stuff, they release methane and sulfur and these bad smelling gases. So if you're having really foul smelling wind, the chances are you might be overfeeding those guys that don't. No, you are having an, an, an imbalance situation is what's going on in that case of being gaseous. Usually the cause of which is eating a diet which is mixed in terms of carbohydrates, proteins and fats. That is a bad idea. That will cause all sorts of problems and will induce all sorts of dysbiosis and problems in the gut. Okay. Show me a carnivore that's been eating nothing but meat and animal fat for any significant period of time that has any bowel dysfunction or gas problem of any kind. Good luck. We don't want to be feeding them too much, so we can help to balance that out. No, you can't. You don't have any idea what you're talking about, Sophie, at all. Clean and with treatment. Treatment. Um Treatment? 
what form does this treatment take? Because that makes it sound like you're some kind of medical professional. You're not. Mm, so excess protein from any source, excess animal protein from any source is not ideal. Excess animal protein from any source. Does excess protein from plants not cause a problem, Sophie? In the context of a mixed diet where there's dysbiosis, perhaps. Perhaps, perhaps. Plants are somehow magically exempt, are they? No. For people. So your gut health, your gut bacteria also really like plant protein. So no, they don't, Sophie. False again. Absolute, utter, ridiculous nonsense. Wrong again. It's like soya. And <laughs> like soya? <laughs> yes, the human body loves soya, doesn't it, Sophie? My word. Do you know anything at all about nutrition or the various toxins that you'll find in plants and plant material? It seems not. Not a damn thing. It's incredible. Tofu, that kind of thing. A tofu? <laughs> good. Soya and tofu. Yeah, good. Good. So ultimately, it's about getting that balance right. A balance, and yes. Remember balance? How that's such a good thing? If you're someone who is having meat for lunch like twice a day. Twice a day meat, right? Probably having too much meat. No, no, false. Wrong. Mm. No, wrong. Just saying you're probably having too much meat and nodding doesn't make it correct. It's wrong, Sophie. False. Yeah, okay. No, not okay. Disinformation. Nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how do I get my protein if not from meat? Good okay. question. Question. So you can use plant sources of protein. Oh, so that's a good idea if you want anti nutrients, plant toxins, indigestible, contraindicated, colon function destroying fiber, pro inflammatory muck that you can't digest, fermenting for days at a time in your colon. Yeah, you bet you can do that. But you'll also generally find with people who rely entirely on plants for so-called nutrition is generally you'll find their muscle mass is very, very comprom compromised as well as many other aspects of their health at large, in fact, Sophie. I wonder why that is. I don't wonder. Like tofu, soya products? That uh, kind of again, with the tofu and soya, do you ever deal with a tofu and soya company in any way, Sophie, perhaps? Stuff and obviously we want it to also not be ultra processed. So I'm not talking about that Beyond Meat burger or that highly processed yeah. vegan product. <laughs> what I'm talking about is adding tofu to your stir fry, for example. Don't, don't have tofu. No, under no circumstances should a human being consume tofu. No, using the minimally processed soya mints in place of meat. no. You should do no such thing. You should eat the meat of animals. Mints, for example, still great sources of protein for no, you. false. You and absolutely no harm. Eggs are slightly no false, slightly less um, dramatic in terms of your bowel function than uh, meat is. So but meat is not dramatic in terms of your bowel function unless you mean in a positive way, because there is. If you to digest, and fish is even better. So if you're having fish regularly, that's great for you in terms but, of well, it depends on where you're getting that fish from and how much heavy metal toxicity issue that it may be uh, subject to, Sophie, for example. Also, is it fresh fish or, or not? Because if it's not fresh, well, there's probably a rancidity issue with the oils in that fish, depending on how oily that fish is and how it's been treated and stored. Okay. Protein source, also great for your brain. No. Lots of benefits to having fish a bit more. There's no evidence whatsoever that fish is great for your brain. That's just an ideology, again their meat. What are the benefits of fish? None. There are no demonstrated benefits of fish. Fish is magical. <laughs> oh, well, there, there we go with the science again. Awesome. Great job, Sophie. I'm glad you're here to tell us all about the science. It's magical. Good. <laughs> <We've> all... <laughs> wow. Kind of evolved. Is it, is it maybe that actually these people realise how stupid what they're saying is? That's why they're constantly erupting into nervous laughter about the stupidity that's just come out of their mouth. Is that what it is? Do you think? I don't know. They don't think at all, in fact. Need a lot of fish in our diet. No, you don't need any fish in your diet at all. 
There is no dietary requirement for fish specifically, none. And in England, we just, like, nobody eats the two portions of oily fish a week. That That's right. false. Absolutely false. You know what everybody in England eats, do you love? And you know for a fact that none of them eat two portions of oily fish a week. I'd bet any sum of money you like that at least one person does, rendering your statement false. What's next? Recommended, right? If we did, the supermarkets would be sold out tomorrow. We need two portions of oily fish a week for our brain health. No, you don't. No. Really, really important. For no, it isn't. Well, which is it? Is it vital, required, or really, really important? Which is it? It's actually none of those. Controlling inflammation in the brain? No. In fact, if you consume too much oily fish that's rancid, the exact opposite thing is likely in terms of inflammation in your brain and elsewhere. Okay? In the structure of your brain. My very clever colleague, Kimberly Wilson, says that if you take out, if you don't eat oily fish, it's a bit like taking out 25% of the bricks of your house and replacing them with polystyrene. Except she's clearly not very clever because it's nothing of the sort or similar in any way to that whatsoever. No. 25% of your brain wants to be made from oily fish. No, it doesn't. Not at all. No. Right? No, wrong. Not right. It's the opposite of right. It's wrong. No. If you take it out of your diet, it's a bit like replacing 25% You've of the brain. said this, and it was wrong the first time. Still wrong. Breaks in your house with polystyrene. No, still wrong. It kind of looks the same structurally, but under a strong wind, you can have a real problem. And it's yes, because there's a lot of wind blowing around in some people's craniums, isn't there? And in their bowels too, apparently, Sophie. A lot of wind. Mm. Great analogy, though. You're doing a great job. Carry on. It's very much the same with our brain health. No, it really isn't still. So you really want to make sure you're getting at least two portions of oily fish a week. No, you really don't want to do that because of the risk, actually, of rancidity. I've done a study on it, an actual scientific study with actual scientific procedure and, and actual experimental stuff, Sophie. Perhaps you'd like to look it up. Taking an omega-3 supplement. You're the very thing my study was about, omega-3 supplements. Check it out. You'll learn something, I'm sure. Vegan, that could come from an algae oil source. Algae, that was the worst, actually. Pretty much of all the omega-3s that we tested in that study. Algae was the worst in terms of rancidity. Okay. So again, you've clearly not done your research. No shock. And so that's equally as good in terms of our brain function. No, it isn't. But also, your gut bacteria love omega-3s. No, so they don't. False again. They don't love anything. No. It's really good for helping to promote the populations of um, beneficial bacteria that help. We don't know which bacteria are beneficial and which are otherwise, if either of those things indeed exist. There is no evidence to underpin such a claim. None at all. False again. Control inflammation in the body. All no. That kind of stuff. So omega-3 from fish is super, super important. For no, it isn't. But it's also a great source of lean protein. You don't need your protein to be lean. And protein can't be lean or otherwise. Protein is protein. It comes packaged usually with an amount of fat if you get it from a reasonable animal source. Animal source. Sure, but protein in and of itself it doesn't have fat because it's not fat, it's protein. Okay. What do we mean by oily fish? So oily fish is like... Fish that's oily. That's why you're a doctor, isn't it? The ones that taste a bit more fishy. But oh, well, that's what it is then. No. Salmon is a great example that people find really accessible. So that's good. But also mackerel is perfect. We could use sardines, that kind of stuff. The ones that are in tins, they're a bit more fishy. Those are the ones okay. that people... The ones in tins, the ones that are almost certainly vastly more rancid. Yeah. Benefit from the most. Tinder tuna? No. Unfortunately, not an oily fish. Oh. I know. That's annoying. And that's what we all eat, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Again, you know what we all eat, do you? And again, with the ridiculous, nonsensical... Nervous laughter. Hmm. <laughs> okay, so salmon twice a week would be good for me. No, it wouldn't. No. Fantastic. I like salmon. Salmon is tasty. Mm. Um, to what extent can I just be like, you know what? I accept all this stuff, but I can't be asked to change my diet too much. If I just take the appropriate number of supplements, I'm good, right? No. 
yeah, no, no, it doesn't really work like that, unfortunately. <laughs> so we need to think of supplements as being like the icing on the cake, right? So we still need to do the foundational. No, we need to think of nutritional supplements as almost universally, not only completely useless, but actually most of them contraindicated in fact. And icing is the last thing you want, as is cake. Okay will work if those if we want those supplements to be working for us so it doesn't matter how many pills you pop ultimately if your diet is terrible you're really but you don't know what that is sophie you have no idea what a terrible diet is at all stressed all the time you're not looking after your mental health you're not exercising you're not looking after your body you're still going to struggle you're still going to suffer so you need to be doing some of those foundational things and then taking your supplements on top to try and get things. Okay, I'm going to go for another 10 minutes or so my time on this. I'm going to stop this video at two hours in length. I think we all get the, the gist here on exactly how knowledgeable, trustworthy, scientific, um, anything that this woman has to say on any topic is, has been or is likely to be at any time now or in the future. So we'll give it a few more minutes and then we'll wind up. Stick with us till the end. In line. And with probiotics, that's even more important because no. you can take as many probiotic bacteria as you like in capsule form or as kefir or however you want to. But if you're not feeding them with plant fiber when they get to your colon. You don't need plant fiber still. They're not going to survive. There's nothing there for them to eat. <laughs> really? It's almost as if your gut microbiome will adjust to what you're eating by becoming... Um, populated with species and phyla and, and, and a makeup that's peaceable and healthy and perfectly good for you based on those bacteria that do survive well on what you are feeding them. Brilliant. No problem. So we have to make sure that we feed them when they get there. No, we don't need to do any such thing. We need to feed ourselves appropriately and let our gut adjust to what we are in fact eating. Okay. Some people will put prebiotics of food for good bacteria in their supplements, but actually need quite a lot of that prebiotic fiber to make any difference. Because you can't actually break very much of it down whatsoever. And actually the best- And it's vastly ineffective anyway. Way of getting that prebiotic fibers from your food, from the food that you're eating. So it's really important to encourage people to still maintain a healthy diet. Yes, but a healthy diet is not anything remotely similar to what you think it is, Sophie, patently. And look after the other things um, because we need to do all the things, unfortunately. Yes, all the things is what we need to do. All the things. Nice. Okay. So less than, well, 500 grams red meat per week, preferably two less portions. Less than 500 grams, yeah. 350 to 500. No, false. Absolute nonsense. Not backed by science in any way, shape, or form. Poor advice. That's a mistake. You've got that I, down. I've got it down. <laughs> yep. I'm like, <laughs> it's like a single steak. It's like, uh, half of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, 30 grams of fiber a day. Which no, 30 grams too many. So us are not getting, so we need to add more seeds. No, we need to do no such thing because they're toxic, hugely. It's grains. No, hugely toxic and problematic. Whole grains. No, yeah. not, not at all. None of those ever. Fruit, bad. veg. No, bad for you. But that has like texture and stuff to it. Mm -hmm. no, you don't need texture. You need nutrition. Fiber. Two portions no, of oil. You don't need any fiber. Fish a week. No, you don't need fish. No. Adding adding in soy mints and tofu. No, absolutely the last thing you should do, just about. Under no circumstances should you go anywhere near anything derived from soy. To replace animal products. Yeah. No, you don't want to replace animal products. You want to seek them out to the exclusion of plant materials, in fact. Other protein. time. Yep. Anything else? What are some other Your facts, I guess? gut bacteria does not like processed food. We don't know that. And like, if you mean don't do well on, because they don't have any opinions, they have no brain. Um, you don't know that either, Sophie. There is no evidence to support that at all. So we think that things like, well, if you imagine preservatives that are put in processed food are there to, to make sure bacteria doesn't grow. Right. So probably not the best thing. That's a fair... Inference, it's a fair summation, but there's no evidence that it is so. And you've just worded it as if it is so. The science doesn't support you on that. The statement was a step too far. You can then extrapolate that and think, okay, well, what's that doing in my body? Right. So but then you cannot make a statement of fact around it. You can say, this is a summation. This is an approximation. This is an idea based on our best understanding, but this is not a fact. Okay.
when I'm consuming these foods with preservatives, actually, are they killing off my good bacteria or at least stopping them from growing? Potentially. So that's something to think about. And we still don't know what the good ones are and the bad ones are if any such thing exists. Emulsifiers that are in lots of processed foods and also in lots of foods that are, have got a bit of a health halo, like protein shakes and mm. protein products, that kind of stuff. Emulsifiers, we think, are disrupting the lining of people's bowels. So when sure. we have too much of those kinds of things, the tight junctions between the cells in your bowel wall, we think are being disrupted and opening up a little bit, allowing too much inflammation into the body. Yeah, and the single biggest cause of that is mechanical damage as mediated by rasping fibre indigestible, contraindicated fibre through your colon. Sophie, sure other things contribute, you bet, and potentially emulsifiers might play a role, possibly, but it's absolutely clear and patent that fibre is the single biggest issue in that regard. That is clear. We've seen it mechanistically. And causing all kinds of different problems, but also disrupting that really important mucosal layer in the bowel that is the home for our good bacteria. Again, with the word good bacteria, no. So Just bacteria is all you need to say. Is not great. You've said that. Um, they're in plant milks and stuff like that, so we need to keep it alive. No. There is no such thing as plant milks. Milk is the lactation of a mammal, Sophie. Anything that isn't that is not milk. Okay. Out for those. Um, anything that is kind of an added ingredient that you don't recognize is something that we want to be a little bit careful of. And there's this amazing data now about ultra processed Amazing data again. Processed foods and how much they are impacting our risk of cancers. No, still. No, not at all. Again, with the word risk. No. All kinds of other conditions. So Which? Because no, still. An ultra processed food is something that we do want to consider trying to avoid. Again, lots you don't of try and do it, you do it, you avoid it. Vegan products would end up in that ultra processed food. All of them. All vegan slop is not food for human beings, whether it's processed or not. Food for human beings is the flesh and fat of animals. Okay. Right. I think that's more than enough for one day. I hope you got something out of the session. There's still two thirds of this ridiculous, pustulous, excremental nonsense from this absolute buffoon to sit through if you'd like to in your own time. I would suggest you probably shouldn't bother, though, frankly. Um, you know, anyone with any sense could take one look at the very beginning of the video and go, mm, yeah, probably not someone I want to take health advice from. But anyway, that's for another day. Uh, also for another day is somebody else that will be wrong on interwebs because it doesn't look like slowing down anytime soon, does it? So in the meantime, enjoy what you're doing. Enjoy some Vivaldi on the way out. Two, three, four.